everyone, welcome back to Real English. Sorry I've been away for so long, I've had a really busy few months, but I'm really excited to be back. This month, because it's the spooky season, I have another gory tale to tell you about Edinburgh and Scotland's history, where we're going to be talking about the Resurrectionists, or Body Snatchers, otherwise known as Grave Robbers. So let's go! So, the need for having an intact body after death has a very, very long history. We can see countless uh, different religions and societies, civilizations throughout human history that really believed that in order to ascend to the afterlife, you needed to have an intact corpse. Think about the pharaohs or Viking burials. And of course, Christianity was no different to this. We really needed to have a body to ascend to heaven. This explains why cremation was so unpopular in the Christian faith for a very long time. Fun fact, guys, that didn't actually really begin to change until after the First World War, when the church couldn't possibly say that the war heroes who weren't able to be buried were, um, couldn't ascend to the pearly gates of heaven. However, in the 18th and 19th century, it was still very much the case that you needed to have an intact body. This, of course, was at odds with the advancements in medical science, because the only way that people could learn more about the body was by dissecting and opening up corpses. Surgeons and anatomists were allowed to cut up the bodies of criminals, but these were often still very, very difficult to come by. There's a record from Aberdeen University in 1636, where the Privy Council allowed a doctor two bodies a year in order to carry out his studies. So it was clear that much more was needed. With the Murder Act of 1752, this began to change. A new punishment was passed as a further form of deterrent against committing crimes, and that was public dissection. Now, this wasn't, of course, to help anatomists or doctors. It was just seen as another reason why you wouldn't want to break the law, because having your body dissected was, for many people, a punishment worse than death. However, it was some good news for doctors and anatomists. The amount of bodies that they could legally access did increase significantly. But even these changes to the law couldn't meet the needs of the medical schools and centres which opened in the 18th century. And it was particularly bad in Edinburgh. Edinburgh University was seen as the place to get your medical degree. Due to the amount of students flocking to the university to study, the demand for corpses simply outweighed supply. The problem was the same for all university towns. It was clear that the easiest way to get corpses was to go directly to the source, fresh graves. Surprisingly, it was initially surgeons and their apprentices who dug up the bodies, leading to local people, quite understandably, detesting them. Surgeons and apprentices would often pay a very high price for taking bodies. Take the example of the 1742 riot in Edinburgh, which, as Edinburgh riots go, was quite something. Tensions had been running high between local Edinburgh residents and surgeons for a while now, but it all came to a head when the public got word that a surgeon called Martin Eccles and his apprentices had allegedly taken up a body that had recently been buried here in St Cuthbert's graveyard. St Cuthbert's was such a regular haunt of medics digging up bodies that in 1738 they actually increased the boundary wall by over two metres to no avail. Bodies continued to be dug up, like the unfortunate Alexander Baxter who'd been buried only a week ago. In response to this, the Edinburgh mob ran riot. They surrounded Dr Eccles' premises, breaking windows and shouting. 
the crowd went on to steal the Portsborough drum, a really big drum that was used to alert neighbours of any problems that were happening in the area. And they carried on smashing up the homes and windows of any surgeons that they could find. Tempers ran so high that the riots continued for a second night. This time, the mob managed to get into Eccles' shop, destroying it completely. Eccles and his apprentices were arrested. However, surprisingly, no proof was found that they had dug up the body. This incensed the Edinburgh mob even more, who were after blood. Because they couldn't get Eccles, they went to get another man who'd been rumoured to be involved and burned his house down to the ground. This reaction is a great illustration of how abhorrent people found the idea of resurrectionists and digging up dead bodies. It was getting riskier and riskier for surgeons and medical students to steal bodies. So it was time to bring someone else in to do their dirty work. Enter the resurrectionists, or body snatchers. It might surprise you to learn that the stealing of bodies wasn't in itself illegal. The corpses had no legal standing. What was illegal was taking anything that was on the corpse or the act of dissecting them. Doctors and medical students didn't ask any questions about where these bodies came from and the body snatchers would generally leave any items that were found in the coffin. So the whole industry existed in a very much legal grey area. So why would anyone want to dig up the dead? Well, it paid very well. You could often make several months wages with just one body. It definitely wasn't for the faint-hearted though, and body snatchers would often have to drink a lot of alcohol before going to work. Not just because of what the corpse might look like, but because of what the corpse would smell like. Gas from a dead body does not smell good. And while it was certainly ghoulish, you can't fault their professionalism. Local gangs would stake out areas to find out who'd recently died in the community. Women were often sent in undercover because they could find out more information without arousing suspicion. They would also find out if any trinkets had been left on the graves. This was something that the poor often did to check if the grave had been tampered with. And they had a remarkable technique for getting the bodies out. So here's my easy 10 point instruction plan on how to dig up a body. Please don't do this at home guys. Step one, you need to identify where the head of the coffin is. Step two, lay a sack along the side of the grave so that the fresh earth doesn't get on the grass and give you away. Step three, move the soil from the top end of the head of the coffin to the bottom. This is helpful for when it comes to breaking the lid of the coffin. Step four, use a wooden spade to keep things quiet. Step five, with an iron hook or a crowbar, tug at the coffin lid. Step six, thanks to your earlier distribution of the soil, this will break the coffin at the height of the shoulders. Step seven, put a sack on top of the coffin to stop the sound of splintering wood. Number eight, this is important guys, stand aside to let the corpse gas escape. Step nine, place ropes around the head or under the arms. And step 10, count to three and pull. A jerking movement probably works best. You might even hit the jackpot and find a pauper's grave. Pauper's graves were great for business because all of these bodies would be buried in one place. They'd give the body snatchers an excellent haul. It did, however, require a slightly different approach. As all the coffins were buried at the same depth, all they needed to do was get rid of the loose soil and concentrate on opening each coffin individually. Such a level of professionalism meant that extra security in graveyards and cemeteries was needed. Fun fact, by the way, if you were wondering, the difference between graveyard and cemeteries is that graveyards are attached to a church, whereas cemeteries are not. In order to protect the dead, watchtowers began to be built where armed guards would keep watch at night. These varied from very basic structures to more sophisticated ones, like the one here at St Cuthbert's. However, watchmen weren't the only line of defence against the resurrectionists or body snatchers. Various degrees of technology was used. One of the earliest and most simple approaches they chose was to just heavily compact the soil when they were digging a grave and put in layers of branches, making it harder to get to the coffin. Sometimes incredibly heavy slabs of stone known as mort stones were put on top of the coffin. But the body snatchers soon learned how to get around that. They'd dig down at the head of the grave and extract the body that way. Clearly more effective solutions were needed. One was a coffin collar. This was an iron collar that went around the corpse's neck and that was then attached to the bottom of the coffin. The next step in the arms race against the body snatchers was the mort safe. Like this one, 
right here. So normally there is an actual Mort safe here, but it's been moved for another part of the exhibition. You can still see here what it looked like. So the Mort safe was basically a iron coffin and the other coffin, the regular coffin, would be put inside it and then buried. That obviously made it very difficult for anyone to open. The body would be left inside until it was decomposed enough to be no longer of interest to any resurrectionists. The upside was that its enormous weight made it impossible basically for grave robbers to get what they wanted. The downside was its size and weight also made it really awkward to get it in and out of the grave. The last and the most sophisticated way of protecting the dead were structures called mort houses. These were mainly used in the northeast of Scotland and were solid and windowless structures which were basically impossible to break into. They were designed with huge walls and heavy metal and stone doors and bodies were left inside until they were decomposed enough to no longer be of interest to any body snatchers. As usual, there was a poor rich divide, even in death. The rich could afford for their loved ones' bodies to be sealed up behind stone walls and iron gates. You'll find a lot of these structures like that one right behind me here, especially in Scotland's university towns. Take a walk around any of Edinburgh cemeteries and you'll see lots of these. Poorer people had to rely on the watchmen who would stand around the graves in the dark. And this divide of how the bodies of the poor and the rich were treated would have dark, tragic and sinister consequences. There were plenty of people who spotted a gap in the market of alternative ways to steal bodies. You would have middlemen who'd go directly to the undertakers or the church officials to take the bodies before they were buried. Con artists would claim the bodies of the poor pretending to be their relatives. There were just some amateurs who happened to come across a dead body or a freshly dug grave. And then there were those who would go to the source itself and commit murder. If you were destitute, and had a strong stomach, this was quite an easy way to make some money. In 1751, Edinburgh residents Helen Torrance and Jean Wilde had an idea to make some easy cash. They would get a weighted down coffin and convince some medical students that inside there was a body of a child. However, when the mother of the nine-year-old child, a boy called John Dallas, decided not to go along with it, their plans fell through. But the five shillings that they would have made was just too tempting. This was probably around £30 in today's money, but equivalent to about two days' full work. They plied John's mother with drink at Torrance's flat, while Waldy slipped out to find the boy. She took him back to her flat where Torrance joined her. There they murdered him, most likely suffocating him. They managed to sell the body to some medical students, but the students later freaked out when they realised what had probably happened and abandoned the body. It was later found Waldy and Torrance were put on trial for murder and later executed here in the grass market in 1752. They were the first known body snatchers to murder their victims, but they definitely wouldn't be the last. Because 80 years later, Edinburgh would see one of the most sensational serial killer crimes in its history. It would so horrify the country that it would lead to a change of law with the Anatomy Act in 1832. This gave free license to doctors, anatomists and bona fide medical students to dissect donated bodies. But more about that in our next vlog. Thanks so much for watching guys, don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time.